Kia ora. welcome to the first lecture of week four. This is the start of quite a big unit, a couple of weeks looking at higher order linear equations. Now you remember from first order equations that we could solve all the linear ones by reducing them to some integrals with the integrating factor method, but we could only we only solved some nonlinear ones, they're more complicated. And that will be true for higher order equations as well. For higher order linear equations, we can't solve them all, that will depend on the coefficients, how complicated those functions of x are. But there is a very beautiful theory of what the general solution looks like, how to solve initial value problems, and how all the um, pieces, when you have a solution, how all the different pieces all fit together. So this is quite a theoretical lecture today. So in the video, I'm only going to do sort of a little overview of the introduction to the ideas. The technical details and the proofs and so on, we'll, uh, I'll refer you to the textbook or we can have another look at them later. Okay, so let's get the terminology under our belt. So here is a formula for the, uh, the most general nth order linear order, ordinary differential equation. So this y parenthesis n, that is just another notation for the nth derivative of y in this case with respect to x, just a little bit shorter there. So I've got all my derivative terms, my y term with no derivative, and on the right hand side I've got a term with no y at all, just a function of x. And these coefficients, a n down to a0 and g, they will determine what method you might use to actually find the solutions. But the theory about the existence of solutions, that works for all equations of this type. Now this is an nth order equation, and you might suspect uh, or guess from earlier that that's going to need n initial values to have a unique solution. So the typical initial value problem would be to specify the value of y at some point, the derivative of y at some point, let's call it y0 prime, that's just a number, and I'm going to need n pieces of data, that means I have to go all the way up to the n minus first derivative at x0. That's my initial data, n pieces of initial data, and typically then if those coefficients were nice, this problem would then have a unique solution. What makes this an initial value problem is that all the initial data is specified at the same value of the independent variable. If you have some bits of data specified at different x values, that's called a boundary value problem, and they're typically more difficult. Now, a lot is going to depend on this right-hand side here, the g of x. Sometimes it's called the forcing term. The homogeneous case is what we're going to do first. That's when g of x is equal to zero, so just equals zero on the right. And the inhomogeneous case is when it's non-zero, so when you do have something on the right. And we'll see in a second that to solve the inhomogeneous case, say it's you know, equal to x or something on the right, what you do is first forget about that and cross it, cross out that right-hand side and solve the homogeneous case first. So. It reduces it to the earlier case. Now, superposition principle. This says that if you have a linear homogeneous case, homogeneous, so that's g of x equal to zero, then if you've got two solutions, you can add them together and get another solution. And you can multiply solutions by constants and still have another solution. In other words, you can take linear combinations of solutions and still get solutions. So this is very important, so we'll, we'll um, actually prove this. And I'm going to introduce this linear operator. It's a n d n d x to the n plus dot 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 plus a 1 d dx plus a naught. So that is a slightly strange object if you haven't met operators before, but what this is is when it applies to y, it just gives you the left-hand side of that differential equation. So the ddx operator applied to y just gives you the derivative of y. So that means the ODE is L of y equals g of x for the non-homogeneous case, or L of y equals zero for the homogeneous case. So the important property 
is that L of a constant times one function plus another constant times another function, now these just can be any functions whatsoever, not necessarily solutions of the equation, is equal to C1 L of Y1 plus C2 L of Y2 for any constants C1 and C2 and any functions y1 of x, y2 of x. In other words, this is a linear operator. It preserves linear combinations. Now, I, I can refer you to the textbook for this proof written out in full, but let's just check it for the simplest terms. Uh, for example, let's do the case uh, n equals 1, a1 d dx, a plus a0 applied to c1 y1 plus c2 y2. What is that? Well, I've got a0 times this thing, that's just a multiplication, and then I've got a1 times the derivative of this thing, so that gives me a1 times c1 y1 prime plus a1 times C2 Y2 prime plus A0 C1 Y1 plus A0 C2 Y2 and C1 is a constant so the derivative of C1 times Y1 is just the C1 times the derivative of Y1 and if you look at it that is just A1 D dx plus A0 C1 times A1 D dx plus A0 applied to Y1 plus C2 A1 D dx plus A0 applied to Y2. So a little bit of writing out, but really not much maths happening there at all, just rearranging things. We're using the fact that differentiation is itself a linear operator, namely the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. The derivative of a constant times something is the constant times the derivative fundamental properties of the derivative. So now I'm done. So if L of y1 is 0 and L of y2 is 0, then L of c1 y1 plus c2 y2 is going to be c1 L of y1 plus c2 L of y2 running out of space L of y1 is 0 because y1 is a solution, L of y2 is 0 because y2 is a solution, so this is 0. So the superposition principle says, make a bit of space for it up here, if g of x equals 0, and y1, I can take any number of solutions now, clearly it didn't rely on just having two solutions. Uh, solutions, meaning L of y, i is 0. Then so is c1 y1 of x plus dot 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 plus ck yk of x. Now this is also a really a result in physics because you have a if you have a physical physical situation like an array of coupled array of masses and springs uh, which is a good model for a large building where the the, the iron struts are very, like very stiff springs once you know the fundamental solutions you can add them all together to get the general solution so we're going to cut this is very fundamental so we're definitely going to meet this later and come back to it Now, if you found a solution y1 and you found another solution y2, that's great, you can take linear combinations, but what if that second solution wasn't really d any different from the first solution? We're really looking for new solutions that we haven't found before. So the definition of linear independence, which should look familiar to you from studying um, linear algebra, if 
I have a bunch of functions. Uh, linearly independent. Oops, try and finish my word there. On an interval. So an interval i might be a less than or equal to x less than or equal to b, or it might be the whole real line. If c1 y1 plus dot 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 plus ck yk equals zero for all x in the interval implies c1 equals dot 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 equals ck equals zero. Now this is exactly the same as the definition of linear, linear, a set of linearly independent vectors. It's just now the, um, the objects, the y's, are functions of x. So instead of just being equal to the zero vector, you have to be equal to zero for all x. In other words, the only linear combination of those functions that's zero is the zero combination. So I'll do a few simple examples here and I'll refer you to the textbook for more complicated examples. Uh, if I had this set of functions, one x, x squared and x cubed, they, that set is linearly independent on the whole real line. Well, what, what do you get if you take a linear combination of these functions? You get a, an arbitrary cubic polynomial. And the only way a cubic polynomial can be equal to zero for all x is if it's the zero polynomial, so all its coefficients are zero. Let's take the functions one sine squared x and cos squared x. They are linearly dependent on the whole real line, but also on any other subinterval. That's because sine squared plus cos squared equals one. So that function minus that function plus that function is equal to zero for all x. In other words, if I was trying to build new functions by taking linear combinations of these, I really only need the first two, and then I could uh, the, adding the cos squared x in there doesn't actually give me any more functions. So here's a linear combination of those three functions that's zero. Or you could say that one of those functions is a linear combination of the other ones. Uh, for the next one, let's take um, x and absolute value of x. What does that look like? There's one function, and there's the other function. So I'm introducing this example to show you that it depends what the interval is. If I took the interval 0 to infinity, those two functions would be linearly dependent on the interval 0 to infinity. They're the same function but they are linearly independent on the whole real line, or indeed any interval that contains zero. There's no non-trivial linear combination of those two functions that gives me zero. Okay, so when we're, looking for, when we're solving these linear differential equations, we're going to be looking for linearly independent solutions to make sure that we're actually getting new information. So coming back to the um, general homogeneous nth order linear equation, what we're really looking for is what's called a fundamental solution set. For the homogeneous equation, what is a fundamental solution set? It is a set y1 up to yn of linearly independent functions on some interval, 
this will yield the fundamental solution set on that interval that satisfy L of Y I equals zero. Notice that I need n of them. We said before that if you had a bunch of any number of solutions, you could add them and multiply by constants and get more so and still have a solution. So really, the new thing here is how many of those do you need to have this fundamental solution set? The answer is n for an nth order equation. So for a second order equation, which we'll be solving quite soon, you need two. Uh, you need a linearly independent set of two functions. Then the general solution is going to be y equals c1 y1 of x plus dot 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 plus c n y n of x. We, we can also show that um, from this general solution you can find the constant c1 up to cn to satisfy any uh, set of n initial data. So allows solution of any initial value problem. Now one thing I haven't mentioned here, which I'll refer you to the textbook, or we'll uh, discuss it later, is how do you tell if a set of functions are linearly independent? So there is a to calculus tool for doing that, it's called the Ronskin. It's a certain determinant of uh, some derivatives of those functions that you can work out, and if, if this Ronskin comes out to be zero, the functions are dependent. If it's non-zero, then they're independent. Okay, so I think our final topic here is to go back to the inhomogeneous equation, L of y equals g of x. And the result is the general solution to this equation is y is equal to y c called the complementary solution plus y p called the particular solution where L of y c equals zero and yp is any solution to l of y p equals g of x. Now this looks a little bit circular. We don't seem to have done anything much, but we have really, because what this is saying is if you can just find one solution to the inhomogeneous problem, and we'll see that that is not as hard as it sounds, plus sometimes you can even guess the solution, then you immediately know the general solution because you just take that particular solution that you found and add in the general solution to the homogeneous problem, which we will already know how to do. In other words, the general solution to the inhomogeneous equation will be C1Y1 plus C2Y2 plus dot 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 plus CNYN plus the particular solution. Now we haven't actually solved these equations yet, but at least we know We'll, at least we'll be able to recognize when we do have the general solution. So that's already big progress. And this is a very general theory that works for any coefficient functions and for any order.